All right, welcome, Matt. Thanks so much for joining us. A big congratulations to start. I am, um, I was an immediate fan of mortality tables. Um, tell, tell us about the, the thinking behind it. You've got, you've got an impressive mission statement there. <laughs> so, um, where to start really? So this, this really started as a joke and that, that maybe isn't the best place to start, but um, a friend and I were having breakfast in, it was November, 2019. We we're having breakfast and in a place, part of London called Bloomsbury in a cafe, a deli called Fork. And um, my friend runs a record label and I knew it was inevitable he was going to give me some of his product to take home. So I always bring a tote bag with me. And on this particular occasion, I had a, um, a tote bag that relates to my actual day job, which is working with insurance companies. And um, it's this tote bag here. It's from the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, that venerable organisation. And my friend said to me, what on earth is that? I said, oh, it's... Uh, to do with insurance you know it's all mortality tables and shit like that and it kind of just stuck and we just kind of joked about it at that time and it was just just a throwaway thing um that didn't have any any real substance to it it was just a just a kind of a little humorous joke we immediately not long after that went into lockdown and and we this this thing became a kind of salvation in some ways having something conceptual to think about and it really was nothing but i do things like i'd make lists and you know i, I made a list of every single t-shirt that i wore in lockdown from start to finish just because i wanted to see how long this this process would extend for and i realized that that had become a kind of an artwork in some ways a piece of, of some creative that i'd manufactured out of just a an idea out of thin air Long story short, a, a lockdown progressed. Like like for a lot of people, lockdown was quite a tough experience for me, kind of mentally, you know, the whole uprooting of your whole life and everything that you hold dear and all of the things that you depend on, the structure in your life, all just collapsed, like it did for everyone. And my, my, my lived experience was no different from anyone's in many ways. But various different things happened. And one of the things was that I... I um, regrettably left my family home for three months left my wife and children behind and moved in with my parents and the same friend with whom I had this conversation that inspired this this project so well, when you when you go to where you're going to live um take an audio recorder with you and and document your experience and I'm 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 a fanatical documentary maker of my own life if you like but not not with video or anything like that but just I record my own life I've always kept a diary my attempts at blog writing have always been very documentary in nature if you like in, in terms of trying to document things that have happened to me and things that have been going on so I suggested by an audio recorder which I did I bought a, a very cheap Tascam audio recorder and just basically recorded natural sounds and natural environments and that type of thing and it became a project and I haven't done anything with it yet but it's a future mortality tables product. Um, it's, a, it's called The Lost Weekend, which I kind of named after John Lennon's departure from Yoko Ono. And it's basically just field recordings of the part of England that I was living in, which is Cornwall, which is in the very southwestern tip of, of England, um, really inspiring sounds. And I think what I did there was I ended up doing a lot of listening and just listening to what was going on. It got me really interested in the whole concept of field recording. The, the challenge, I guess, is that I, I don't think of myself as a creative person at all. I'm, I am, I'm a writer and by sort of, um, by extension, I'm a writer of, of music reviews and interviews and that type of thing. And I'm quite you know, established in that field. But I don't really think of that as being particularly creative and that's not to dismiss that as a, as a process, but when I'm writing a review of an album, I'm just listening. I'm, all I've got is my ears and my emotions and my emotional response to that overall. So that doesn't feel particularly creative to me. That feels like, you know, that's just something that I feel anyone could really do. And I'm told that it's not. But you know, we, for the most part, most of us have got an ability to listen. And um, so I don't think of myself as a creative person. So I lack confidence in my creative abilities. And so the idea kind of started to form, and this is where you 
really start to see mortality tables appear in some ways and where you first latched onto it Kevin is this idea of coming up with ideas that you give to other people to respond to and in some ways I, I think about this I maybe I'm hiding myself in that project in some way but equally I've accumulated a lot of contacts a lot of people that whose music and um, sound work I respect who I know that I could never do anything remotely like them. I'm, I've, I've attempted to make music in the past. It's been awful, truly awful. You know, it's it's clearly not my my skill at all. But there's all these people that I've interviewed or engaged with whose work I really respect. And the idea of coming up with an idea and my role being the creator of that idea and handing that to someone else and hearing how they respond, um, and it might not necessarily even be a sound piece. It could be a piece of, of, you know, an illustration or something like this. Or there's a someone designed me a an actual mortality table prototype. You know, it's kind of taking the the name a little bit literally. <laughs> That's part of the project. No one's bought this. This is available for sale for charity, but no one's bought it. But um, that's an aside. But I just I just love that idea of just kind of handing these things out into the ether and seeing what comes back. You know, and sometimes what comes back is you approach someone and they say no, and that's their response. And that's completely valid. You know, I'm engaging with people who are busy. You know, this is a, a side of the desk kind of activity for them. Very often they're too busy. They just don't have the capacity to do it. So they say no, but, but more often than not, they say yes. And it's such, it's a thrill to hear someone who's, whose work you respect say yes. I'm, um, last year I interviewed John Wozencroft from Touch and he had a very, very similar experience at the very start of that, of his um, his, his and Mike Harding's um, publishing company, Touch, where the first um, group that they approached was New Order hmm. and asked them if they could contribute something that they were trying to do. And they said yes. And John said that feeling of someone saying yes to something that you've kind of innocently pushed out there with all your inhibitions and all your kind of fears of what might come back for someone to say yes is just such a thrill. Mm. And in many ways, that's it done as far as I'm concerned. The fact that someone said yes, the fact that someone has said, I will respond to this creative project that you've come up with. Thereafter, whatever they deliver is just a gift for as far as I'm concerned. I've got no ability to critique that in many ways. It's very pure in that sense. But very often what you get back, like the most recent things that, that started to appear, the, the Life Files series with initially Simon Fisher-Turner and then it will be other people involved as well. You know, Simon said, are these okay when he sent them through? And my response is, yes, of course it's okay. Mm -hmm. I never want to change anything because I'm in awe of what's come back. You know, it's, it's started with an initial kernel of an idea. It's become this thing. It's come back in the way that it's come back. Who am I to then judge and say, no, go back and edit that? Or no, no, that wasn't quite what I was looking for. You know, That's not what this is all about. It's just the response to a creative endeavor. And I'll issue it and I'll put it out into the world or whatever it is. But really the job's done as soon as it comes back. And I can't criticize, I can't critique it. It's just wonderful to get something back. What is it that you ask the artist to do? Is there a theme that you've asked them to explore or what? What's the assignment? Okay, so so if I look at the the Life Files series, which has just just started. I mean, this started in twenty twenty one. I interviewed Simon Fisher Turner for a field recordings uh, interview for Electronic Sound, who I do a lot of writing for, and um, I've known Simon for a long time, and it was such a thrill to to be able to interview him again. And his approach to capturing sound was a real inspiration to me. I mean, it was you know. He's, he's a professional sound recorder, but he's also a documenter of life. You know, of, he calls them life recordings rather than field recordings because they're things that have happened around him. Mm. And, um, and in that instance, that's a, inspired me to just kind of, you know, whether it was with my um, Tascam recording device or whether it was on my phone, just kind of making audio notes, just becoming more aware of what was going on around me and just, and then listening to, 
to the world and being more aware of the world and um, just just sort of factoring that in. And so I, I, I'd send these over to Simon and Simon would, to my great surprise, I'd say, here's something I've recorded. It, the first instance was in a gallery. It's my first gallery experience after lockdown. It was just wonderful to walk around it, but it was empty. You know, it was kind of, you know, how, how do I document this empty gallery moment? I couldn't think of any better way to do it than to record the, the natural environment, the ambience. I sent it to Simon and Simon came back with a piece that he constructed around whether it's my footsteps walking around the gallery or me just standing in front of a piece of, of, of an object, he then sent us back. And so thereafter, in that particular series, what it was a case of is I would find something that, that interested me from a recording perspective, just, just whether it's standing on a platform at a station or sitting in a churchyard or, you know, walking through a market square or whatever it might well be, send that off and allow Simon to come back in whatever way, shape or form he wanted to. So that was a very kind of, there was no instruction there whatsoever. It was just, here's a sound, there's the response. There was literally no request or expectation. It was the, the most pure expression of a, of a creative exchange to me in many ways. But other times things have been more instructive in some ways. So that, that, that was quite a naive experiment in some ways, but there's another another piece that hasn't appeared yet, um, but will later on this year, which is very linked to a very personal theme, which is um, my father has Alzheimer's and that experience of living with my father for three months in 2020, I got to see his decline in close quarters. And um, music became a really important characteristic of that time of being with him. Uh, and it was a little bit irritating, but he got a, a tune stuck in his head. And this tune, he would repeat it over and over and over. He'd hum it and hum it and hum it. But he didn't know what it was. And it became a bit of an infuriating earworm to me. that I didn't know what it was either. And eventually managed to identify what it was. The, the crazy thing about what he'd done is my, my dad has no musical ability whatsoever, much much like me. But he managed to almost take on this kind of jazz soloist persona because you take this this short section of melody and then hum it so many times that it kind of became an improvisation it kind of kept changing and and by the time he'd finished you say that was that was a, a good one dad he, he wouldn't even know what he was actually humming. Partly it's his memory, but partly it's because he devolved the, the melody so far from where it originally was. And it occurred to me this was kind of like a um, the kernel of a project that was all to do with me a memory and how, how memory dissipates over time and how we see our memories degrading over time. So I, I en engaged with a, a sound artist in just outside Philadelphia who goes by the name of Batona Music, and asked him if he could consider a way that he could come up with a, a, a kind of a sound piece that was basically doing what my dad's memory was doing and kind of degrading. And so essentially took, we found what the original piece of music was. Um, he sampled that, looped it, and allowed that loop to kind of just become something else by the end of it and sort of unspool in some ways, like it was like a memory unraveling. So that was a very specific instruction in some ways. It was, you know, I want to create a piece, a sound piece that responds to this idea of failing memory using this particular melody that was the melody that my dad was humming. So that was quite an instructive piece overall. And that will come out later this year. That's called GM degradations. I'm not allowed to say for copyright reasons what the melody was, um, but essentially it was a it's a classic piece of big band music that got kind of disrupted in this in this process. There's another thing um, that's a, a quite a specific instruction in some ways that uh, again hasn't hasn't appeared yet, but will do hopefully at some point this year. Again, it's sort of linked to my father. I, I wrote a, um, a short story, which I'm not, not, you know, as a 
I don't consider myself, like I said, a creative person particularly, but I, I created a piece of fiction, wrote a piece of fiction, and this kind of like a, a fantastical reading of my dad's life in some ways. It's called The Engineer. And um, it, well before even Mortality Tables was even an idea, I got a um, playwright, actor, record label guy called Barney Ashton Bullock um, to narrate the story. And it lasted for precisely 15 minutes, which I thought felt strangely like the right length for the one side of a tape. You know, reasonably chunky sort of length of time, but not too long. Uh, and it wasn't intended that it would last 15 minutes, just, just how long it lasted. I thought, well, it'd be really good to get some musical accompaniment to this in some way or sound accompaniment to it. Um, and I sort of don't make too much of a distinction between sound and music. It, it's all, you know, I'm a bit um, borderless when it comes to that kind of idea. I'd accumulated all these people that, that whose music and sound and, and work I respect and, and um, just happen to know. And I got to a magic number of 30 people and decided that it would be really good if I could ask them all to contribute 30 seconds of sound in response to a 30 second segment of Barney's narration. And that was an amazing experience going out to people with this kind of weird abstract concept of you know, here's a fragment of narration. You're not going to necessarily, or you don't even want to hear the whole thing. You just get your 30 seconds of it. It's completely out of context. Come up with a, a sound response to that. I've got such amazing things back. You know, it's not all electronic. A lot of the stuff I I enjoy and engage with because of writing for electronic sound. A lot of the people I work with are, are electronic. But in this instance, I've got um, a trumpeter. I've got a pianist. I've got... Um, people who don't consider themselves musicians at all, all doing these pieces of music or sounds that will then knit together. And actually, they won't sit behind the narration. They'll sit on the other side of the cassette as a sound response to the narration. And the two will be completely separate overall. But that was, again, quite a specific instruction, was respond to this particular chunk of sound. And again, so many people came back and said, is it OK? Is, is what I've done OK? And the answer was always yes, you know, because I can't. So, sorry to interrupt. It's amazing, though, how not just willing, but even eager people are to engage in a kind of exchange, right? That just given permission to express yeah. themselves in some form or another, people almost always say yes. It is remarkable. I, I'm, I'm blown away by the fact that anyone would want to engage with this because it is it's a venture into the unknown. You know, you're you're saying, can you do this? Will you do this? Would you like to do this? And it's an innocent question. And most often I do expect people to say no, but they don't. They genuinely do say yes. And and some of it, you know, in that particular project, the, the 30 second segment has proven a real challenge for a lot of people because trying to express themselves in a 30 second segment, even though to me, I go, well, that's, you know, you get in there quick, you get out quick. That's, you know, surely you don't have to think about that too much. Some people have really agonized over it because it's out of their comfort zone because they're used to longer form pieces. And one of the, um, one of the contributors to that is Vince Clark from Erasure, who I, I've gotten to know pretty well. He's worked with me on another Mortality Tables project already. I was amazed that he would even entertain the idea of being involved in this because it's so, it seems so far from what you expect from him. The 30 seconds that he sent me back to go into this project was so distinctively him. And that became the case with all of these pieces. You know, if you have a familiarity with that person's work, what came back was something that sonically was just immediately identifiable as that individual even though they're not used to working in 30 second fragments. You know, it's not in Vince's piece, it's not, it's not like he's put a fantastic synth pop melody into there at all. In fact, I think it's got two notes of a melody in it and that's it, but it's immediately recognizable as him. One of the other 
contributors is a guy called Chris Illingworth from the band Go Go Penguin, who I absolutely adore. I think they're an amazing, amazing band. Um, he delivered a 30 second piece is so immediately recognizable as him. And yet he had, he, by his own admission, had agonized over this. You know, he couldn't, couldn't figure out how to get into it, couldn't figure out how to kind of express himself in 30 seconds. Well, what he delivered back was so intuitively and recognizably as him. But some of it, I think, is because, you know, this isn't necessarily the field that they're used to working in. So some, in some ways, it's a, uh, there is an ability to express themselves in a way that maybe they don't in other scenarios, or maybe it's just, um, it just feels different. And so they want to do something different, or they quite like being challenged. I don't know. Um, I've never really thought to ask. Is that true of you? To an insurance industry professional who has a blog about mute records, who writes for various publications, and is it a reaction to your day job? It's a really interesting question, actually. I um, I really like the idea of kind of inhabiting different worlds where you don't necessarily feel that you belong. And um, so you're absolutely right. I mean, my my day job is. It's horribly corporate in many ways. You know, it's it's not a creative job. It is it is a a job working with insurance companies. It's not exactly the most exciting. I don't get me wrong. I enjoy it. I enjoy that job. I I enjoy every moment of it. But there's always this kind of other side where you you have a hankering to do something different, and it's maybe it's a release. Maybe it's just a a reaction to that corporate world you feel like you have to express yourself in a completely different way um i like the idea of occupying those two worlds and um so sort of one of the, the the projects that we did last year was um i called it a manifesto i mean it's not really a manifesto it's just kind of it was me trying to it's probably among the most serious things i've done it was me reflecting on death and reflecting on how one might live beyond death through the creative things that you do in your life or or simply memory you know the way that um I'll be honest a lot of the time my children my two teenage daughters probably look at what I do and go what the hell is he doing you know you know all this music that he listens to that just uh, can't understand it at all there's an accumulation of things that I've done that you hope that you know in years to come when I'm no longer here they look back and appreciate that and in some way you've kind of extended your mortality in some ways by by living on through the things that you've done even though at this precise moment in time none of those things are appreciated none of those things are seen as credible or valuable or, or anything other than a distraction quite honestly but you hope that in some way that might live on in somehow and um there's kind of a, a we have I sort of conceptualized the figurehead for this whole project, which is the composer Charles Ives, who um it's a well-known story, but Charles Ives wasn't famous as a composer during his lifetime. You know, his pieces weren't really broadly recorded. Charles Ives was principally an insurance industry professional. He was an actuary. Um actuary is a bit like electronic musicians. I'm very in in awe. You know, there's a discipline, a skill, you know, something that I know I couldn't do. And Charles Ives was in both of those worlds, but he was most famous during his lifetime as a groundbreaking insurance actuary. Invented estate planning. Yes. I mean, his, his, I, I can't remember the name of the book. I'm trying to get hold of it. He wrote a really, really um, important thesis on, on exactly that inheritance planning, life assurance, um, fundamentals in many ways, which kind of in, revolutionized the industry. Yet quietly in the background, or not actually not even quietly, because some of the things that he did were extremely noisy, you know, playing the piano with the whole of your forearm to be able to get all those note clusters. The idea that he could be in his day job doing something very staid, very kind of technical, very professional, very upstanding, you know, putting a suit on every day and going off and doing these things. And yet in his spare time was composing works that would go on to become groundbreaking. And I'm, I'm, uh, as, as I understand it, virtually no one in his professional life had any idea that he did this. No, and, and it's it's funny, for a long time, I never shared 
with anyone that I did uh, music journalism outside of work. And I was quite happy to keep those two worlds completely separate. And I still am to a certain extent. I'm slightly, in my professional job, slightly embarrassed if someone finds out about this and kind of brings it up in conversation. It's kind of, it, I just find it weirdly uncomfortable. And yet it's not something I'm not proud of at all. I love this kind of out, extraneous kind of stuff that I do. But in my day job, I'm in my day job. And in my outside of my day job, this is my world. And this is the world I want to be in, in that space. But it's just about compartmentalizing time. But I mean, like I said, I don't I, in no way, shape or form think of myself as being like Charles Ives, far from it. I just think that he is a, a useful metaphor for how you can occupy these different worlds comfortably and he's not... Also, in sorry, he, he's, he's also um, one of the earliest examples of the notion of a side gig. Mm. So many artists today can't depend on their art for a living. No. So they have a day job. Yeah. And we've always thought of that as a very modern phenomenon, but Ives proves that's not at all the case. The original architect of the psychic, you know. Um, yeah, it, and so we we kind of the our, our lo the mortality tables logo is an illustration of Charles Ives. You know, we decided to do that. And it's very deliberately in front of a actual mortality table from the year of his birth. Oh, uh, wonderful. Um, which uh, an illustrator whose, whose work I've always admired, a guy called Savage Pencil, Edwin Pouncey, he did that. I should ask, Someone... explain what a mortality table is. <laughs> it's a very, very grim concept. It is essentially, um, a, a simply a table that's got ages down one side and the expected lifespan of a person of that age. And essentially, the insurance actually uses that to be able to spread risk. So you build a pool of different people whose life expectancy is going to be different because you know then that apart from some cataclysmic Holocaust type event, it's likely that not everyone's going to die at once. So you pull all those risks together. And so you have a bunch of people who've got a short life expectancy, a bunch of people with a long life expectancy. And the mortality table is it's a bit like black magic in some way. It's kind of predicting when these people will slough off their mortal coil. Um, but that's how you measure risk in that sense. So, um, and I'm sure today it's just delivered with an algorithm, but you can go back and we did you can find these beautiful old mortality tables from the 1860s, from the 1920s, um, that forecast when people are going to die. It's grim, but like I said, it started with a joke. Mm. That's how it started. Extraordinary. Matt, thank you for this. You're very welcome. Very best of luck. Thank you.